Well, thank you so much, Stephen. That was a, an inspiring, uh, you know, tribute to, to the city of Los Angeles and the county of Los Angeles. Um, we're going to give Stephen a few moments to catch his breath now while I invite our panel up to the stage. Um, we are going to have our two Auckland experts um, and then Stephen can join as well. So, First of all, uh, to my right, we have Tony Alexander, who I'm sure many of you will know from media appearances and other, other um, outreach that he's done. He is the chief economist of the Bank of New Zealand, one of our kind supporters this evening. And next to him, another face I'm sure you will all have seen before, Nick Hill, the chief executive of Auckland Tourism Events and Economic Development and of course Stephen uh, last but not least on the stage there. So I thought we could start our conversation off with a couple of questions to our, our panellists um, and just see where it goes from there. But just a reminder, we would love to have your questions as well. Please do go to slido.com um, to put your questions <coughs> excuse me, into, into that device. We would love to hear your uh, tricky questions for our panellists. So, Let's start with, with those panellists. Tony, uh, I'm going to start with you first. Uh, I have a question here for you about something that I know is very close to your heart, um, which is about house prices. And I'm sure, being Aucklanders, we're all fascinated by what Tony will have to say to this question. Tony, is it reasonable for people to think that house prices, relative to incomes in Auckland, will go back to where they were pre-global financial crisis? Nice, easy one to start. Yes, an easy one to start. Basically, I wrote the question for Stephanie to ask. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm the economist who had the different view from all the other economists on the Auckland housing market, mainly from sort of 2008, but especially from about 2011, 2012. People could see prices were rising and were saying, some people are hurt by these prices rising, the rental yields are going down, uh, prices should go down, and therefore they uh, will go down. And I said, well, go back and do your basic economic analysis of looking at the growth and supply of housing, which in 2011 was at the lowest uh, uh, level of production of houses in Auckland uh, nationwide, in fact, since the 1960s, and look at the growth in the population, which of course has accelerated tremendously um, over the past four to five years. And I said, I think the Auckland house prices will continue to rise. So if you do have your cell phones there, you can Google Tony Alexander 19 reasons, not 13 reasons, for goodness sakes, but 19 reasons, and you'll find something I wrote in 2012, listing why house prices would rise. Um, the first version was 2011, but you can't probably find that. Now, many people simply don't, I guess, grasp that what we've seen with the house prices rising strongly is a permanent structural shift in house prices, in share prices, in commercial property prices, reflecting a whole variety of things. And starting with assets generally, one of the biggest things that's happened over the past few years has been since the global financial crisis, inflation around the world has settled at a low level. Wages growth is simply not accelerating, even when unemployment rates fall tremendously. We have had the interest rates, therefore, turning out to be much lower than people were thinking. And while one might think it's good that a young person going out now and can come to the BNZ and get a three-year fixed rate special deal, 3.89% just for you um, at the moment, and that's surely good compared with the 18.5% I paid back in uh, 1987, I was better off back then than the low interest rate environment now, because the low interest rates have been factored into the higher prices of all assets around the world, basically. And it's not just from the borrower point of view, it's from the investor's point of view. If you can't get yourself a decent yield any longer in bank term deposits or government bond yields, people have gone into these other assets, such as the shares, commercial property, and residential property um, as well. And it does not look likely at all that inflation is gonna bump back up. The period from 1973, first oil price crisis, to 2007, the onset and after that of the global financial crisis, that was the aberration of high and variable inflation, high and variable interest rates. We're now back in the 1100s, the 1560s, of sustained low inflation and low interest rates. But there's more than that which explains the rise in house prices. These days, if you're buying a house, you always say, you need two incomes to afford a house. Well, 40 or 50 years ago, there was only one income bidding at the auction for a house. And the first families that had the partner also go out and enter the workforce, they could buy a better house. 
And so over the past four to five decades, the price of houses has gone structurally upward to reflect the fact that there are two people's incomes coming into the household who can afford to pay a house. These days, you buy a house, the toilet is on the inside. Previously, it was not necessarily. There's more than one bathroom. You have to meet energy efficiency standards, uh, seismic standards, consenting fees need to be paid, developers' fees, hefty inspection fees, uh, uh, materials need to be tested, etc. We have an ageing population, and the older the population, the more houses you actually need for that number of people. Older people are divorcing later in life, and if you're 60 and you get divorced, you're probably not going to go flatting you're going to maybe still want your, your, your own house. In the late 1980s, we saw a change in New Zealand's migration rules, uh, away from source country to what skills, what education, et cetera, can you offer? And we've seen a permanent change in New Zealand's net migration flows. Now, this is a big one, and it's hugely relevant to Auckland in particular, because Auckland gets about a net 60%, maybe 55% of the migration flow in and out um, of New Zealand. And if you go back to the 10 years leading up to 1988, mm, uh, um, on average, each year in New Zealand, we lost 16,000 people. The 10 years to 1998, we gained about 9,000. 10 years to 2008, we gained about 11,000 people per annum. In the 10 years to 2018, on average, we gained 29,000 people, and we gained a net 56,000 people in the year to March of this year. And over the past four years, Auckland's population has grown about 11%, rest of New Zealand about 7%. And it is to Auckland that the migrants tend to come, and the young people tend to stay as well. I've actually got a list of 13 reasons here as to why their prices have sort of structurally uh, gone up, I, I sometimes go through. But the upshot is, I don't see the migration flows reversing. I don't see suddenly the interest rates rising by five or um, 6%. I don't see uh, older people deciding, let's stick together even though we hate each other's guts and we'll stay in this one house. And I haven't even mentioned Airbnb and the houses taken out of the market for that. So this is a permanent repricing of the housing market. And what do I think happens now, just in case that's what people are interested in? Auckland, you're flat. You've been flat for two years. You probably stay flat for another two to four. And then the simple pressure of population growth exceeding what is accelerated growth in house construction will eventually push the prices up for a bit further. But for the moment, the market is flat, and it's going to stay that way for a while. Thank you for the question, Stephanie. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tony. Well, we'll come back to that passion project of yours. Um, but before we do that, I'd like to hear from our other panellist, Nick Hill. Nick, if Auckland continues to grow the way that it has in the past, how will we ensure that everyone in all of our communities is able to share in its prosperity? Um, thanks, Stephanie. Um, when I gave you that question, um, I didn't realise it was sort of like solving world peace. Um, but I think... The way I'd like to start to try and answer it is maybe just to respond to Stephen's um, presentation about LA and contrast Auckland with that and do that quite quickly if I could. I mean, I think you started saying you had uh, an economy of 900 billion um, per annum? 800. Um, so Auckland's economy is 90 at the moment. Um, we, and if you think about infrastructure, you think about industry, and you think about people, um, we're very, very similar, as, as Stephen pointed out, to LA. We are a gateway to New Zealand, and uh, particularly through the airport in, the, in recent years, the connections with the rest of the world have grown, exponent, not exponentially, but hugely. There's 300 flights a week to different um, uh, airports in the world. They're, the port itself has been growing significantly. I think it's one of two deep water ports in, in New Zealand. Our digital connectedness um, has, has also advanced significantly. And as Tony's just mentioned, you know, migration is through Auckland. 40% um, of Aucklanders were not born in, in Auckland. So in many ways, we are a city that f performs a similar role to LA. We um, are changing very quickly. LA is a very young city. Um, Auckland is a young city. We're at a cusp of uh, enormous um, growth and change. We've, we've come a long way in the last 10 years, but when we look forward to the next 10, we're talking about 50 billion of infrastructure investment in the city. And when you layer over 
the migration patterns you layer over the impact of technology uh, and the future of work, we're going to look extremely different in 10 years' time. In terms of industry structure, also similar to LA, um, there, there is a large amount of manufacturing in Auckland, food and beverage, for example. A, a large part of New Zealand's food and beverage manufacturing actually happens in Auckland. Uh, so too, um, our screen sector, um, we're not Hollywood, but our screen sector is a billion dollars a year, employs 7,000 people, and it's currently developing very, very fast off the back of the likes of video on demand through Netflix and so on. Uh, in terms of people, and you talked about the, um, the, uh, uh, the universities, UCLA, uh, and uh, your other uh, tertiary institutions in, uh, in LA, uh, we too have um, universities, tertiary training, and so on. That's a supply of talent to, to Auckland. So in, in many ways, we're very similar. I think also the diversity of Auckland and your own story, I think we could probably find many of those same stories in this room and certainly in the city. Uh, I think uh, some learned journal recently described uh, or found Auckland was the fourth most diverse city in the world. We, we have an incredibly diverse population. I think one thing, um, where we, may, we differ from uh, LA, I, I think is that we um, have a, an issue around scale and distance. I mean, it's not a, this is not um, uh, new or profound, we all know this, but it does mean we, as a, as a city and the markets that we operate in New Zealand, um, are a lot smaller and that has consequences. We are not, we cannot be as dynamic, we cannot specialise and, and build um, industries out of Auckland in the way that perhaps you can in LA. So that scale advantage is challenging for us. I think with our markets, and I think you look at the construction sector, for example, uh, it, in many ways it's a model that's broken, but partly that's a function of being a small country and how you manage risk and with the fact that we load liability onto our councils who then have high, high standards. They, those standards then exclude people. We have a small building materials industry of two dominant players, and suddenly our cost structures are enormously high compared to our neighbours in Australia. So the size and scale of New Zealand is different. I think one great strength we have in New Zealand, and it's become really apparent uh, uh, just in the last couple of days as we've hosted tripartite um, with guests from LA and from Guangzhou in China, and that is the fact that we're a bicultural country and that our uh, Māori, Pacifica, um, uh, iwi um, actually help leaven and help provide values that when we look to the future and the challenges we face globally, but also within business and within economies and jobs and, and, and um, you know, developing, provide us with some, some pretty sturdy longer term foundations that are universal, resonant, unique, and um, help to resonate with um, the rest of the world, but who, who go to our identity. So I'm gonna finish shortly, but part of the answer to prosperity fu is fundamentally about why people would want to come to this place, why they would invest money, time, their careers, their reputations, bring their children up here, develop businesses, why would you do that? And it's answering that question that I think um, will help guide us to, to you know, the, the creating prosperity and, and sharing it more widely within the city. Thank you so much, Nick. Well, I have a, a couple of questions that have come out of these three fantastic sets of remarks today, if I may. Um, and I'd, I'd like to start off actually um, with, with both Tony and Stephen, because we've heard a lot from Tony about housing, the housing crisis, house prices. Although they're flat, a lot of people you know, have a lot of trouble being able to afford a house. Um, Stephen, you've talked about the homelessness challenges in LA, but I know that there's also been a, this real challenge on affordable housing as well. So are there any lessons that you could share with us? You know, what, what could Auckland be doing to create more affordable housing? Is it about 
intensification? Is it infrastructure? You know, what's the answer? Over the last, I would say, uh, 20 years or so, we realized, um, actually longer than that, we realized we made huge mistakes back in 1920s. <laughs> um, we had the world's most advanced public transportation system called the Red Line that connected everywhere in Los Angeles uh, at that point. And when the automobile sector, uh, the tire manufacturer, and the real estate uh, uh, folks came together, they wanted to present this uh, tropical paradise of Santa Monica where you can drive on these huge freeways and your Cadillac to these great homes and they ripped out all the tracks. And so we've been catching up since because we just created the traffic issue that we cannot resolve. What we see now, the solution, is transit-oriented design. You need to build density housing around major transit corridor that connect the work, uh, the, this concentration of where the workplaces are. Um, that's the solution. So we're now playing catch-up because we had this enormous sprawl. Uh, you saw the geography of Los Angeles, so it's available for them to basically keep on expanding, expanding, so you can be outside the density, cheaper homes, but at a certain point, they're no longer cheap, and now you just have a massive area where everybody's driving into downtown in Santa Monica in the morning, and the 405 freeway, which is known uh, around the world as the worst freeway in the United States year after year after year. We spent a billion dollars and over a year to expand that freeway by a lane to increase capacity, and as soon as it's open, traffic got worse by 1%. <laughs> So now we know it has to be public transit uh, and it has to be transit-oriented design. I think that's something to consider uh, and I, th I think many other cities around the world are looking at it. Tony, I know you love infrastructure almost as much as talking about housing, so would you like to, would you like to comment? Yeah, well, Auckland is most definitely playing catch-up as well and the problem for Auckland is that uh, none of you are going to be marching up to your councillors and say, Sales tax. I saw this guy talk about a sales tax, the idea. Let's have one especially in Auckland where I'll pay an extra 5% on everything I buy in Auckland in order then uh, that we can improve the motorway system or the public transit uh, system. Just think how disgruntled you already are about the uh, petrol levy, the special legislation which was required to that. And a key difference you'll find between the, the cities in um, New Zealand and especially in America and a lot of the rest of the world is that the ability of the council here to raise money is extremely limited. Overseas, cities have a whole range of options, income taxes, sales taxes, um, um, property taxes, etc., which are simply not available here. And what that's allowed overseas is cities to focus on their growth in terms of we, we're going to grow and we are actively competing against other cities to grow as well. And so we're going to invest ahead of time the best we can for the public transport systems, the housing locations, etc., et maybe creation of industrial parks, transport infrastructure facilities, because we want to drag business out of, uh, out, out of other cities. Now, that's never been the case in New Zealand. Nobody in Auckland is seriously thinking of, I'm going to do something which is going to attract business out of, uh, out of Omaru or out of, uh, out of Whangarei. Some may move, the attraction, of course, in the minds of many people is let's try and get it out of Auckland um, the other way. But the focus on Auckland, of Auckland has never really been we really need to position ourselves with affordable housing, etc., in order to attract population in here. And, of course, hearing that, you'll be thinking, but Auckland's attracting population anyway, so there's really no effort required um, in order to do that. And I'd love to give you a, pop, uh, a positive message of saying, I think with a bit of extra planning there, everything's OK. No, no, no. It's going to get phenomenally worse for you poor beggars that are commuting into the city every day. I think your transit times are going to slow down any further, even further because the money is simply not there in order to develop the uh, uh, system as quickly as possible. And I think maybe there's a little bit of honesty required here when that people are trying to sell the idea of the light rail system between, um, say, Queen Street and out to the uh, airport. It's, uh, what, 20 kilometres long, maybe 19 stops along the way as a possibility, same as the existing light rail system across on the Gold Coast. It takes 45 minutes to go from one end to the other. So don't try and sell it to me as a quick way of getting to the airport. I take Sky Bus when I've got the time. It really is the route along which the city has to intensify along Dominion Road or wherever. And people need to honestly come out and say, we have to override the interests of the existing people along that transit route, and there will be big intensification of housing along there, because that's the only way you can maybe make a little bit of a dent towards affordable housing. But seriously, I don't think there'll be a, a substantial change. Definitely. Well, I can see that's provoked a few uh, questions from the audience. We will come back to you in a second, but I just wanted to ask one thing of Nick. Um, so please keep those questions in your minds. 
um, because I'd just like to pick up on a couple of things that have been said about the need for more capital inflows, essentially, more investment to be able to fund this much needed infrastructure. So Nick, I mean, you talked about the challenges of, of scale and so on in New Zealand. How do we keep in attracting investment into Auckland to fund, I mean, this, this growth that we need to be able to afford all these sort of broader, inclusive elements for our societies and our communities? What's the answer there? Um, well, there's probably a few things, but just first of all, can I um, uh, um, support what Tony said? I think more than 90% of all public money is raised through central government, which is then controlled through the political processes and bureaucracy of Wellington, which is making decisions about Auckland. And the prevailing view of Auckland um, in Wellington is that we're helping you say, solve your problems in Auckland. It's not thinking about Auckland as this is fundamental to the economic success of New Zealand and that the natural drivers and incentives are towards urbanisation and cities competing around the world for people and for capital. So part of it is, I think, a pretty fundamental shift in the perception of what the role that Auckland plays in the country. And I think we're paying the price for being somewhat arrogant about the rest of the country calling us Jaffers, and they're uh, basically responding. And I think that we need a more mature view about what that relationship uh, is with, um, with uh, uh, Auckland. The se uh, probably the second thing I'd say is that um, we're actually a, a very closely held country from an asset point of view. Actually finding things for people to invest in in Auckland is extraordinarily hard. There are lots of people, and there's plenty of capital available. It's not the lack of capital, maybe apart from some parts of startup, that is the problem. The problem is, where do we invest? So I think partly it is comes back to a lot of uh, assets being held uh, in public ownership in some form or other, or else in trust-type ownerships and so on. So I think there is an issue there. I think a third. A third area um, which we particularly want to attract is smart FDI, where global corporates, smart investors, talented uh, investor migrants are deciding to locate their businesses in Auckland. So how do we attract those people, those corporates to be located here? Because it's their activity that will attract other talented people, support educational enterprise, uh, and attract further investment. So I think there are probably a number of layers to this, but certainly I think fundamentally we've got a challenge around, uh, as Tony has pointed out, about how we fund the necessary investment and in infrastructure to advance the city. Can I add, add one more component to that? Um, I wouldn't recommend that you guys go taxing, even if you have the ability to do so, because uh, California actually has some of the highest taxes in the nation, and every year we're losing a lot of business to other states and other regions that are using that against <coughs> us. So the only way for us to actually replenish the companies that are coming out is to really attract foreign direct investment coming in as a marketplace to enter, but it's becoming a huge challenge. And second, just because you build it, uh, unlike the freeway, you build it and they come, we build the public transits and they spent um, billions of dollars on the light rail from um, downtown to Santa Monica to the beach, uh, the ridership was actually not as high as we expected because just because you build one line, it still doesn't solve the entire issue. So until the whole system is done, we're not gonna see that improvement. And so traffic is still bad and people are impatient with the progress. So although I gave you the, the rosy picture, again, I promise you the good, the bad, and the ugly, it's not as simple as simply taxing yourself. And even if you, you could, you might not want to. Can I pick up on something you said there, Stephen, about connecting communities? Because you also said something rather lovely at the, in your remarks, the strength of our economy is our people. And I think that's true of you know, this wonderfully diverse Auckland as well. But of course, we do also unfortunately have some underserved and some really struggling communities. So what has LA done or what lessons can you share with us about how to ensure that we move in the right direction on on reducing inequality rather than growing it, on incorporating and enabling all of our communities to share in this growth that you know, we would hopefully generate. Yeah. It's, a, it's been a struggle and a challenge continuously for us. Uh, Los Angeles has a, a lot of glamorous history, but some not so glamorous history includes the LA riots, uh, 
both in the, in the 50s as well as in the 80s as well. So it's been happening over and over again as an underlying issue based on income inequality disparity. So what I would say is we, there's a lot of um, programs that are created in order to encourage more uh, ethnic minority groups to run for office and to be elected to be represented that way. That's, why that, that's when their voices are heard and they're also able to create programs or structure it through their community. But through changes in the economy, gentrification is also coming in. When gentrification comes, also you change entire electoral map. So these changes are so quick and so fast that we're not really able to address all the issues. So we don't have a panacea. We don't have a solution that we can offer. What we can say is I think what's worked for us as, uh, as we're moving forward is having leadership um, take stance and encourage diversity. Uh, mayor Garcetti from Los Angeles has made a commitment that he is uh, the first mayor in the history of Los Angeles to have all his commissions staffed uh, and, and, and managed by over 51% female representation, which has never happened before. California now made a, a mandate that for all public boards, for companies, they have to have at least one female representative on the board of directors. So these are the, the policies that are made to encourage diversity when it comes to gender uh, uh, equity, uh, as well as racial diversity and, and inclusion as well. So one step at a time, we're not quite there yet. These are just some of the mistakes we've made along the way that hopefully you guys will see, uh, maybe hopefully you can avoid as well. Nick or Tony, would you like to, to comment on that, that sort of social inclusion issue, or should we throw it open to some very patient audience members who I know will have uh, got some burning questions for you. Uh, just briefly on the, the social inclusion issue, I mean, it, it, it's a huge challenge in Auckland. It's uh, getting worse. Uh, future of work is going to make it worse. I think we've got some real issues around how our labour market and education, um, uh, potentially immigration, how they come together and the decisions that are made around that. I think in New Zealand we've become very, very siloed, and uh, I think there's a real disconnect between secondary schools, uh, employers, training, uh, and the way that market is working in the city. And part of that is goes down to infrastructure, but part of it goes down to some pretty uh, sort of historic views about how that should work. 